today we're going to look at Gaussian processes as a, another way to do regression. Yesterday we already looked at, uh, at linear regression where we saw that maximum likelihood estimation and even map estimation can lead to overfitting problems. Then towards the end of the lecture, we looked at Bayesian linear regression as a way to address the overfitting issue, but there were also some shortcomings in terms of like the, the number of features uh, or feature engineering. And I try to motivate to maybe think of Bayesian linear regression as a way of um, putting or implicitly putting probability distributions over functions. And I wanna exactly pick up at this point today again, where we're gonna get a quick recap of uh, Bayesian linear regression where we ended yesterday um, afternoon and then transition into Gaussian processes. Basically the main reference uh, for Gaussian processes is this book by Carl Rasmussen and Christopher Williams called Gaussian processes for machine learning. The PDF is online available and it's relatively readable. So I would recommend having a look at this book. The problem setting that we are considering is very similar to yesterday. So assume we have a set of observations yi, which are f of xi plus epsilon. Epsilon is again some, some Gaussian random variable. We are interested in finding a probability distribution over functions, so p of f, that explains the data. So we're looking at a probabilistic regression problem. So this is really closely connected to uh, Bayesian linear regression, where we were looking at a probability distribution over the parameters of the problem, which then induce a probability distribution over functions. So this is exactly the setting here, but instead of looking at the posterior distribution over the parameters of the model, we are trying to look at the distribution over functions directly. If we make a prediction at some point, we will get a, pred uh, a predictive distribution out of this. So unlike when we were working with map and maximum likelihood estimation where we get point estimates, we get a full probability distribution um, at, uh, at the corresponding input for the function value. Gaussian processes are useful. So I would say they are, for regression, they are definitely the gold standard if you're interested in predicting with error bars. They are also widely applied in, for example, reinforcement learning and robotics, in Bayesian optimization. So we're gonna get into this later this week. Geostatistics, sensor networks, time series modeling and long-term predictions, high energy physics, medical applications, but also in climate science. So people use Gaussian processes in many, many applications. So therefore it's very useful to understand how they work, what the underlying assumptions are, and also what their limitations are. Before we get into the Gaussian processes, I would like to kind of like recap Bayesian linear regression. So in Bayesian linear regression, we specify a prior on the parameters of the model. And normally it's a Gaussian prior because it's, uh, it's a conjugate prior, which allows for closed form computations. Um, we also in the default setting, look at the Gaussian likelihood. So P of Y given X and the parameters theta is Gaussian distributed with uh, mean phi transpose times theta and variance sigma squared. In Bayesian linear regression, this parameter theta, which shows up linearly in, in, in this uh, equation here, becomes a latent variable or a random variable. So it's treated as an unknown quantity. And in a Bayesian setting, we then when things are unknown, we place a prior distribution on these unknown quantities. And this prior distribution induces a distribution over functions that make sense under that prior distribution. So with the Gaussian prior, which we chose up here, we also get a closed form posterior distribution on the parameters so that the parameters are the quantity of interest. So the unknown quantity here, so we get a posterior distribution on the parameters given some training data, which is also Gaussian distributed with some mean and some covariance matrix. So the conjugate Gaussian prior allows for closed form computations. For example, we can compute the posterior distribution in closed form, 
but also we can make predictions in closed form, we can compute the marginal likelihood in closed form. So we're looking at a very simple uh, Bayesian linear regression problem where the observations y are given by a plus bx plus epsilon, epsilon again our Gaussian random variable or Gaussian noise variable. Now we place this 0, 1 Gaussian prior on the parameters a and b, so the, our parameter vector theta would be a and b. And so this is kind of the, the visualization of our prior distribution. And so if we generate a sample from this prior distribution, then we can draw a corresponding function here on the right hand side. So for one instantiation of <clears throat> A and B, uh, so we draw one sample from this Gaussian prior, this gives us uh, one value AI and, and BI, and we can draw the corresponding function as AI plus BI times X. And that is the corresponding function over here. So if we continue drawing these uh, functions, Oh, sorry, these, um, these uh, parameters A and B will get corresponding functions here on the right-hand side. So these are draws from the prior distribution on the parameters, and that would give rise to um, corresponding functions here on the right-hand side. So these, the functions on the right-hand side are functions that are plausible under the prior distribution that we set. If we make the prior distribution a bit bigger, so for example, um, 10 times the identity matrix, we would get functions or we can draw functions which are a bit steeper, but also which are a bit more offset from, from zero, because then more extreme values of A and B are plausible. So if we now co uh, collect training data, so these uh, crosses over here, so X uh, and, and Y, then we can compute uh, the posterior distribution on our parameters A and B. So we get this posterior distribution on A and B, and our posterior distribution would be now visualized like this. And you can see that the posterior distribution is much more concentrated than the prior distribution. So many parameters don't make sense anymore that made sense under the prior. And if we now draw functions or sorry, parameters from this concentrated posterior distribution, then the corresponding function would be a plausible explanation of the data. So any of these functions could have generated the, the data set. If you collect more data, the posterior distribution get more, gets more concentrated. But any of these functions here makes, uh, makes some sense. Now, the approach we are going to take now is that instead of sampling parameters theta, which induce this distribution over functions, we want to sample functions directly. And in order to sample functions directly, we need to place a prior distribution or some distribution on, on functions. And with this, with, with, when we choose a prior, then we also need to make explicit assumptions on the distribution of functions. So now this may be a bit complicated and unintuitive, but if we think of a function as an infinitely long vector of function values, maybe it's easier for us to make assumptions on the distribution of function values. Yeah, so if we, especially if we look at maybe a finite number of function values, then we would just look at the distribution of, uh, of a finite dimensional vector. And then we can do, you know, we can place our normal distributions or distributions we are familiar with on this vector. So, and that is exactly where the Gaussian process comes, comes into play. So we will see that the Gaussian process is very closely related to the Gaussian distribution and Bayesian linear regression. You need to be familiar with manipulating Gaussian distributions. So if you have a joint Gaussian distribution, and you know how to compute the marginal distribution, how to compute a conditional distribution, and how to multiply Gaussian distributions together, you are in pretty good shape. This is now the uh, kind of like the overview of the entire lecture. So we're gonna start with the kind of like definition of what a Gaussian process actually is. We will then uh, phrase regression as an inference problem. So I already maybe mentioned this a little bit earlier. We're interested in 
computing a posterior distribution over functions. Computing a posterior distribution is an inference problem. So we use Bayes' theorem to compute this posterior distribution. And we do exactly this uh, in this section here. So we, when we look at Bayes' theorem, we have a prior distribution, which we're going to discuss here, a likelihood, a marginal likelihood, and a posterior distribution. And then we're also going to look at how to make predictions. We're going to look at uh, model selections. We're going to look at uh, how to train a Gaussian process, how to select the, the right components in the Gaussian process. For example, a covariance function or a mean function. Then at the end, we're going to look at limitations and some practical guidelines which make, uh, may be useful when you implement these things. And then also a, brick, uh, a quick look at uh, application areas. I would like to know what's the key advantage of Gaussian processes over Bayesian linear equation on a high level? What's the key advantage? So Gaussian process makes it a bit easier to specify assumptions on the underlying function. So the Gaussian process will make, uh, will allow us to specify high level assumptions such as the function is periodic or the function is uh, smooth or five times differentiable. Whereas in, in many other cases, we would need to specify, for example, the degree of the polynomial. So that's a relatively low level assumption. So in, in, in Bayesian linear regression, you want to make a prediction at say P of Y star given X star. So that is the, the predicted uh, target given an input. And what you would do is you compute P of Y star given X star and the parameter theta times P of theta D theta. So, and with this integral, you um, consider all plausible values of values or maybe settings of theta. And that is infinitely many of them because we have a continuous distributions on the values of theta. In the in the Gaussian process, we're going to see this later. We do the same thing. I'm going to copy all of this. And I'm just going to replace a few things. Instead of like theta, I'm going to write f. And then we have the Gaussian process. So f is now the function. So we will be replacing the parameters of the linear regression model with the function itself. The equations will be, otherwise will be identical. Okay, so then let's get started. We want to place a probability distributions on functions directly. So P of F is now a, distributions on, a distribution on functions. So this is maybe a little bit strange to do, but maybe we can think of a function as a vector that consists of function values. So if we look at, for example, the real line, then a function could be the function values uh, evaluated at f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, f of x4, and so on. So densely on the real line. But if we think about it this way, then maybe it's a bit easier to place distributions on function values. You know, maybe we want to place a Gaussian distribution on these function values. A Gaussian process allows us to do this by generalizing a multivariate Gaussian distribution to infinitely many variables. So if we had only, say, two function values, so F1 and F2, and we wanted to place a Gaussian distribution on the distribution of these two function values, then we could do this by, with a bivariate Gaussian distribution. Similar to what we actually had uh, earlier when we had P of A, B in this, uh, in this uh, example. Uh, here, we would now place, instead of like placing a distribution on A and B, which were the parameters here, we would place a distribution now on function values uh, f of x1 and f of x2.
the so the Gaussian process now will allow us to do this to infinitely many variables. We can make an assumption about how infinitely many variables are distributed. The definition of the Gaussian process is basically that if we look at uh, an infinite collection of random variables, and let's just call them f1, f2, f3, and so on, if we look at any finite subset of these uh, random variables, and this finite subset is Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian distributed. So if we have an infinite number of these function, uh, sorry, of, uh, of these random variables, f1, f2, and so on, but if we slice out any finite subset of them, they are jointly Gaussian distributed. That is the definition of a Gaussian process. It may not be clear at the moment why this makes our life easier, but if we keep in mind that a Gaussian process says that any finite collection of random variables that we consider is jointly Gaussian distributed, we pretty much get to the end of this lecture. Now, there are also some things that are connected between Gaussian distributions and Gaussian processes. So if you remember, the Gaussian, distribut uh, Gaussian distribution has a mean vector and the covariance matrix. The Gaussian process has a mean function and a covariance function. So let's maybe think about what the mean vector and the covariance matrix do in the, in the case of a Gaussian distribution. So the mean vector is the expected value of, of a random variable. And a covariance collects cross-covariance terms or correlations between random variables. The Gaussian process has this mean function which allows us to compute the expected function under the Gaussian process distribution under P of F. Similar to the expected value of a random variable, we can compute an expected value of the random function. And the covariance function allows us to compute uh, cross correlations between function values similar to exactly what the covariance matrix does. So every entry in a covariance matrix uh, computes the cross-correlation uh, cross or cross-covariance between two different random variables. And the covariance function or the kernel allows us to do this between uh, function values. In this part, we will phrase regression as an inference problem. Specifically, for a set of observations y equals f of x plus epsilon, where epsilon is Gaussian distributed with mean 0 and variance sigma n squared, we want to find a posterior distribution over functions that explains the data. Here we write the posterior distribution as p of f given x and y, where x are the training inputs and y are the corresponding training targets. But how do we get to this posterior? Well, we can use Bayes' theorem. And then the posterior is the likelihood times the prior divided by the marginal likelihood. The prior P of F is a Gaussian process, and the prior requires us to specify a mean function and a kernel. The likelihood we can think of as a noise model, and it tells us how function values f of x are related to noisy observations y. Here we consider a Gaussian likelihood, which means that an observation y is Gaussian distributed with mean f of x and variates sigma n squared. The marginal likelihood is also called the evidence. By definition, it's the integral of the numerator here. That means it's the integral of the likelihood times the prior, where we marginalize out the random function. Keep in mind that the marginal likelihood is just a number. That means it no longer depends on the random quantity, the function on which we place the prior. Therefore, for the time being, its main purpose is to ensure that the posterior is normalized. We'll get back to the marginal likelihood later. The posterior itself here is a Gaussian process as well, and it is fully determined by a posterior mean and a posterior kernel. Let's make a connection again with Bayesian linear regression. In Bayesian linear regression, we placed a prior on the model parameters theta, and that prior allowed us to encode some properties of the parameters 
such as a range or reasonable values. We also saw that every sampled parameter from that prior induced a function. In the Gaussian process case, the prior on the parameters is replaced with the priors on functions. Here, the function plays the role of the parameters. But when we sample from a GP, we directly get a function as a sample and not a parameter vector that induces a function. In that sense, the GP basically allows us to take some sort of shortcut. In the Bayesian setting, the prior allows us to specify some assumptions on the quantity of interest. That means the quantity on which we place the prior. In the Gaussian process case, this quantity is the latent function. My question to you now is, what assumptions could we make on the underlying function or what characterizes the function that we may wish to model? Think about it for a moment. There are some things that we could consider. For example, we may want to model periodic functions or functions that are twice differentiable, or functions that have a linear trend. In the Gaussian process, we can use the mean function and the covariance function to specify these kinds of properties of the underlying function. And now we are going to have a closer look at these two things. Let's get started with the mean function. Similar to a mean vector, which we can think of as an average of a random variable, the mean function we can think of as an average function. And we can use the mean function to bias the GP, which can make a lot of sense in application-specific settings. For example, we could use a parameterized function as a prior mean function, such as a linear function or a neural network. A linear prior mean function would be m of x equals theta transpose times phi of x, where theta are the linear parameters and phi are some features. In the simple case where phi of x equals x, our prior mean function would say that we assume that our data lies on a straight line similar to here. And then the GP would effectively only need to model the difference between the best straight line we can find and the data. The prior mean function can also incorporate problem-specific prior knowledge. For example, in mechanical control, the dynamics of a throttle valve system can be approximately described by a linear function of the angle and velocity. If we use a linear mean function here, the GP does not need to learn this relationship from scratch, which simplifies the learning problem so that the GP can learn the underlying function with less data. If we don't have that kind of prior knowledge, we often use an agnostic mean function, that is, we set the prior mean function to zero everywhere for similar reasons. The second quantity that we can work with is the, is the covariance function. And the covariance function allows us to do a lot of interesting things. So by definition, the covariance function uh, is one of these, uh, the kernels that, that were mentioned earlier. Uh, is so that is a symmetric and positive semi-definite function. But besides this, the interesting thing is that the covariance function allows us to compute covariances or correlations between unknown function values by just looking at the inputs. So we will we will be interested in computing the covariances between f of x i and f of x j, but we actually don't know what f is. So that's a bit of a problem. But the covariance function allows us to compute these covariances by evaluating the covariance function at the corresponding inputs xi and xj. So the xi and xj, we know. We don't know what the corresponding function values are. But the covariance function allows us the covariance between these function values without actually knowing what f is. And that is based on the, on the kernel trick in, in kernel methods. So it's exactly the same idea that is, uh, that is happening here. Um, but I, I don't want to go more into details about kernels and, and uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and this kind of stuff. Uh, that would go far beyond what, what I want to talk about today. We can also use the 
covariance function to encode these high level structural assumptions that we discussed earlier, for example, smoothness and periodicity of the underlying function. And I'm going to show you some examples of how we, how we can do this. Here's an example, it's called the Gaussian covariance function or squared exponential sometimes or exponentiated quadratic. The corresponding analytic form is given up here. It looks like a Gaussian shaped function with two parameters. So one is an L parameter and one is the sigma F parameter. So this entire thing here is an exponential with a squared distance inside between, so squared norm between xi and xj, which is scaled by L. Uh, and then the sigma F kind of like uh, increases the amplitude of this Gaussian shaped function. So if we use this particular kernel or covariance function, the underlying assumption that we then make on our function that we want to model is that the underlying function is smooth, which means it's infinitely often differentiable. At the bottom here, we have draws from a Gaussian process with this particular kernel. So you can see that these functions are super smooth, really nice. And so these kind of functions we would be expecting to describe um, with this choice of kernel. So now I would also like maybe have a quick look at what the parameters mean. Sigma f, that's the, the term up here, explains the amplitude of the, of the function that we want to model. So if the function values that we observe are in the range of like maybe 10, between 10 and minus 10, for example, then we would need um, a higher sigma f value than for function values that would be between uh, minus one and plus one. So the sigma f will pump up the or down the amplitude of the functions that we can model. And then there's another parameter in here, which is L. So L is called a length scale. And so now this length scale parameter is very important for, for a correlation between function values. So it tells us how far we have to move in input space, so here in, in X space, before a function value can change significantly. Assume we are in this uh, setting here where no, we have an observation here at the bottom, let's say um, x0. Now, L tells us how far away from x0 do we have to walk for function values to become significantly different. Say, if we choose this function value uh, up here, how far do we have to walk uh, to the left or to the right for this function value to change significantly if we just focus on the red line for the time being? If we only walk a little bit in this direction, so these function values, they are still correlated, but if we, if we were to walk maybe over here, then these two function values, um, so this one and this one are pretty much uncorrelated. L encodes how far we have to walk for, for things to become un, uh, uncorrelated. And I'll give you some examples in a, in a moment. What this function looks like, it looks like this. So if this is, this is xi, the width is L, the amplitude is sigma f squared. Um, maybe that's a little bit optimistic with this. Um, because, so this part is between zero and one, right? So if you now have a multiplier sigma f squared in front of it, it increases the, the height of this function. And so the width of this function, you may, maybe can understand uh, L is similar to the, the standard deviation in a Gaussian distribution. But keep in mind that this is not a distribution, so this will not integrate to one. Um, but L tells us, or encodes, so if you, if you remember that um, K of Xi and Xj, is the covariance between 
f of xi and f of xj. Now, the, the covariance between f of xi and f of xj is zero or close to zero if xi and f, uh, xj are very far from each other. Yeah, and this so it's approximately zero if xi and xj are far from each other. And far depends on L. So even if if L, let's say if L was maybe a hundred and xi and xj were like 50 apart from each other, they would still look very similar. They would still have, um, would be strongly correlated. But um, if L was only one and xi and xj were 50 apart, then, all right, so in one setting, x, so for L equals, say, if this is xj, for L equals 100, then um, xi and xj would actually look very similar to each other. But if L was very small, then, you know, xj would look like this. And then xi and xj are very far from each other uh, with respect to this, this kind of like distance. So this, this thing here is uh, the squared norm of the difference of xi minus xj over L. So L scales this, scales the distance. So the longer or the bigger L is, the further xi and xj can be apart from each other for the corresponding function values to be strongly correlated. And um, if L is very small, then you can only walk a very small distance in function space, uh, sorry, in x space for the corresponding function values to be uncorrelated. We can really think of this as a smoothness parameter. And somebody mentioned earlier, uh, you know, can we encode slowly varying functions? Um, yes, we can by setting L to be a very, uh, to, a, to a very large value. Here are some examples, uh, what I meant earlier with the amplitude parameter. So if I were to draw functions from a Gaussian process prior with um, sigma f, sigma f I call here the, the signal variance. So the, if the signal variance is four, these functions could look like this. If we make the uh, signal variance smaller, then you can see how the, how the functions kind of like get squashed together. All right, so this is kind of like what the, what sigma f does. It kind of like scales the functions I can model with the Gaussian process. Let's have a look at the length scale parameter. So this L parameter, it tells us a little bit informally maybe how wiggly the function is or how, how much the function values vary if we move distances away. But it also uh, tells us how much information we can transfer from some function value to other function values so it allows us to, or it kind of really defines the correlation, correlation between function values by, um, by scaling this distance between the corresponding inputs. It tells us how far we have to move in input space from x to x prime to make the corresponding function values uncorrelated. And here maybe pictures are um, maybe better than text. So, if I draw, so if I define this norm x minus x prime to be uh, the norm of tau, so if you if you set x i to be at zero, then and I'm moving x prime, sorry x uh, to be at zero, and I'm moving x prime a little bit further, and the norm will increase, and that is what is shown here on the on the horizontal axis. And I have now five different covariance functions, so all with the same, uh, so sigma f is one, but I'm going to vary L. So the vertical axis here shows the correlation between f of x and f of x prime. If L is 0.05, you can see that if I only move a very small distance in input space, the correlation between the function values kind of like plummets, it goes to zero. If I move like 0.2 away from x, then, um, these, the function values will, vary uh, will be uncorrelated pretty much. But if I have a longer length scale, 
then I have to move much further. And if I have a very long length scale, then pretty much everything is strongly correlated. What does this actually mean for the, for the underlying function? If I were to choose a short length scale, what, kind of, what would you expect from the, from the underlying function? What does it look like? Is it a slowly moving function, slowly varying function, or is it a fast varying function? Option A or option B more plausible with a small length scale? Here are some examples. Um, uh, again, so you've seen, so, so these are samples from a GP prior with a very short length scale. So length scale is 0.05. You can see that these functions are moving very fast. I'm going to increase the uh, length scale now. So if I increase the length scale to, so from 0.05 to 0.1, you can see that the, the functions become a bit more um, smoother or let's say more slowly varying. And I can go uh, to, to other extremes, uh, right? So with a much longer length scale, you can see it's a very slowly moving function. So there's this, this uh, website that we, uh, we built a while ago for an introduction to, to GPs, where you can also play around with, um, with these things. So this one, this plot you've seen uh, in the slides, these ones are you can play with these uh, with these in, uh, with these diagrams. We can increase and decrease the length scale. You can see how the underlying functions change. The same you can do with the signal variance. You can see how these functions go up and down, and other parameters as well, like the noise noise parameter. If you increase the noise or decrease the noise, the functions will also look differently. You have also an interactive diagram up here where you can I just reset this entire thing. You can add some, some data points and you can see what the Gaussian process does with settings of length scale. So if you decrease the length scale, you kind of like see what happens here. If you increase the length scale, you see that the function uh, is much more smooth. Um, you can increase the the standard deviation, so the sigma f parameter, you can see how what effect that has, or the noise parameter, and you still keep uh, adding uh, adding data points in here. So you know there's a lot of stuff you can play around with. So I would encourage you to have a look at this. I hope this is useful, but if it's not useful, please let me know why not. So what what are things that we can improve? We looked at one covariance function which is the uh, the gaussian covariance function and we discovered kind of like what the properties of the of the parameters of the of this covariance functions are so the the amplitude parameter and the length scale parameter we also said that we can use the gaussian covariance function to encode a prior assumption on the underlying function we wanted to model which is it's un, uh, infinitely often differentiable and I want to briefly go through uh, some other covariance functions as well, uh, just to make sure that we get an idea of like what, what can be done relatively easily. So here's a, a Vatan covariance function. So the exact uh, analytical expression doesn't really matter um, at this point. But what this covariance function allows us to do is it allows us to uh, encode that the function that we want to model is one times differentiable. So the Gaussian one was like infinitely often differentiable. This one is one times uh, differentiable. And so example functions would look like this. And you can see that these are much rougher than the examples that we had in the, uh, in the Gaussian case. And we have the same parameters in here. So an amplitude parameter, which is sitting here, we have a length scale parameter, which is also sitting here. And they have exactly the same meaning that they had in the, in the Gaussian case as well. Then there is a periodic covariance function, which is given by this. It also has an amplitude and a length scale parameter, so no longer it's not worthwhile discussing them. There's the same reason, uh, same meaning that they had before. But it has an additional parameter in here, which is kappa, and the kappa parameter encodes the or is a periodicity parameter. So the underlying assumption on the latent function is that we model periodic functions. And so examples of these functions are, um, are given down here. 
And we can see that, you know, they don't have to be simple periodic, but they just have, need to have some periodic structure. We can also write the uh, periodic kernel in a way that it's a transformation of uh, inputs xi by lifting them to the complex plane. So if we take uh, x and, and uh, map this onto cosine of kappa x and sine of kappa x, and we use then this embedding inside a Gaussian kernel, we would get exactly the this kind of like a periodic covariance function out. We can also build new covariance functions. So assuming we have two covariance functions, so K1 and K2, and assume we have U is some sort of like transformation of the input space. So it could be nonlinear transformation, could be neural network if you want to. Then the sum of two covariance functions is a valid covariance function. The product is a valid covariance function. And K, so a kernel evaluated at a u of x and u of x prime is also a valid covariance function. And so we have done this already with the periodic covariance functions on the last slide. So if you remember, we defined u of x to be cosine of kappa x and sine of kappa x, and then embedded this into the Gaussian kernel. So that is this kind of like nonlinear transformation of the inputs and embed this into a Gaussian kernel. That is a valid kernel. And in this case, would be the uh, the periodic one. You can also use neural networks as transformations of the input. So there's something on uh, called manifold Gaussian process which does this, or if you look at something called deep kernel learning that does this as well. Yeah, you do a, a neural network, use a neural network to uh, transform inputs, and then feed the transformed inputs into a kernel of a Gaussian process. So that is kind of like what these these two methods do. So all of this, these are valid kernels. There's also some work which is called the automatic statistician. So you can uh, look this up on the web where effectively the idea is to build an automatic tool for analyzing data. And what happens there is that they use Gaussian processes for modeling the data and try to learn or try to incrementally make the covariance functions more complicated. So they start with something simple, like some, let's say a Gaussian kernel, and then find the best kernel to combine with to make the, the model more expressive, to model the data better. So either by addition or through multiplication, for example. And so this entire procedure is automatic. And then at the end, it will also give you a report about automatically graded on your, on your data. So have a have a look at this if that sounds interesting. How do you know that you you should choose the covariance which is one time differentiable or which is periodic or how do you know which covariance mm -hmm. to choose? So that's a that's an excellent question. So we're going to discuss exactly that question. It's towards the end of the of the lecture. Uh, we will discuss how to choose kernels, uh, what we can use to choose kernels. We spent uh, an hour on the on the Gaussian process prior to give you an idea of like what the what we can do with mean functions and covariance functions, what the parameters of the mean uh, oh, sorry covariance functions mean. I want to go through all of the other things as well. so we're going to look next at the at the likelihood, which is this gray term here. If we look at the the likelihood in linear regression, so that one should look familiar. Um, right, so we have the probability of y given x and theta is Gaussian distributed uh, with mean theta transpose x and sigma squared uh, as the variance. Keep in mind that the likelihood is a function of the parameters. It's not a distribution of the parameters uh, because the parameters are sitting here. It describes how parameters and observed data are connected or maybe also tells us how to transform parameters into noisy data. So that is kind of like what the likelihood does. In the Gaussian process setting, we're also going to look at the Gaussian likelihood. Uh, and we have exactly the same kind of like setting here. If for a given input and a, and a given f, then our likelihood is also Gaussian with mean f of x and sigma squared as the as the variance. And again, so th just think of the parameters um, are the function itself. So parameters 
theta here are being replaced by f. So that is kind of like what, what, is, what is happening here. So the next quantity I want to talk about is the marginal likelihood. So if we look at uh, Bayesian linear regression yeah, with a simple uh, zero mean Gaussian prior, then the marginal likelihood is uh, p of y given x. So the integral of p of y given x in theta times p of theta d theta. And keep in mind, so y are the training targets and x are the training inputs. Kind of like predicts the training targets given the inputs. So it still normalizes the posterior distribution. It can be computed analytically. And here's the expression, um, expression for that. We can also interpret the uh, marginal likelihood as the expected likelihood under the parameter prior. So that is just rewriting this integral as an expected value. We can also think of this as the expected predictive distribution of the training targets. Right? So this is a predictive, so p of y given x and theta is the predictive distribution of the training targets given the inputs and the parameters. So that is what, what this is. And so if we integrate out the parameters, then it's the expected predictive distribution of the y values under the parameter prior, so we, or with respect to the parameter prior. So that is what happens in Bayesian linear regression. And now we're going to make the jump to the Gaussian process, and we'll see that all of this transfers more or less directly to the Gaussian process. So we have now this equation here, or this expression here. So this, uh, this would be f, that's, uh, that's a typo. I'll fix that later. We still have the, uh, the properties uh, from before. So the, one of the jobs of the marginal likelihood is that it normalizes the posterior distribution. Again, in the Gaussian process setting, it can be computed analytically. And here's the equation for the marginal likelihood. And I'll explain what k is in a moment. And we have exactly the same um, interpretations of the marginal likelihood that, uh, as we had before in the, in the setting of the uh, of Bayesian linear regression, either as the expected likelihood under the GP prior or as the expected predictive distribution of the training targets under the GP prior. So this is exactly this kind of expression where we write this integral as an, um, as an expected value. So the log marginal likelihood is given by this expression here. And the matrix K is the covariance function evaluated at each pair of inputs. So if you remember that um, K of Xi and Xj is the covariance between F of Xi and F of Xj, then this K matrix is this joint covariance matrix uh, that contains all cross correlations or cross covariances between all function values that we um, consider in the training set. And that is the, uh, the corresponding expression. So if you take the logarithm of this Gaussian distribution up here, you will get this expression um, down here. And n is the number of training data points. So now I want to have a look at the posterior distribution. That is, event, in the end, that's kind of like what we are interested in. We can define the prior distribution. We have something that allows us to compute the marginal likelihood. And also, the likelihood is something we can define. Now, the question is, how do we get that posterior distribution? If we use, again, we use property of Gaussian distributions. And so if we multiply, now, the likelihood up here with the prior in so the green term, if we multiply these two things together, we get we take a, a Gaussian distribution, which we multiply with, a, with an infinite dimensional object, which is this Gaussian process. What we get out of this is uh, a Gaussian process as well. So, so finite dimensional object times infinite dimensional object gives infinite dimensional object which is now scaled by this Z. So it's an unnormalized Gaussian process. And the Z is this, uh, the marginal likelihood term. So now the expressions, and now we're coming back to the question, one of the questions we had earlier, 
for this posterior mean function. So the posterior mean function is the prior mean function plus some other stuff. Similarly, the posterior covariance function would be the prior covariance function minus some non-negative quantity. That is this expression here. The marginal likelihood that we already computed uh, earlier is given by, by this ex uh, expression here, right? So we can think of this as a Gaussian um, function in that sense, where we have, we look at the difference between y and the prior mean function evaluated at x, and then uh, an uncovariance matrix of k plus sigma n squared times i. So that is what the, what the marginal likelihood looks like with a generic mean function and the generic prior um, uh, uh, kernel, which is this one here. I'm gonna come back to this in, in a few minutes, but I want to maybe also give you a constructive way of sampling, uh, sampling functions from a Gaussian process. So maybe at this point, I think we are maybe all a little bit confused, you know, if you sample an entire function, how would you actually do this in practice? Because every time we generate a thing or a sample from a GP, the sample will be an entire function. So now, how do we do this? We can't actually sample functions directly. That's uh, maybe it's a bit unfortunate, but you know, that's what, what it is. But we can think of a function, again, as a collection of function values. Yeah, so if instead of like drawing an entire function here, I can draw just a bunch of function values, which are these dots. And then, you know, whatever plotting tool we use, it, it will connect them in some way that it looks like a function. But when we evaluate, for example, cosine of x, we also only evaluate it at a finite number of points. And then we ask uh, Matplotlib or some other tool to, uh, to interpolate so it looks nice. So and then we're gonna do this exact, exactly this kind of thing here. We are going to uh, evaluate the a draw from a GP, so this function that we draw from a GP at a, at a finite number of function values, and then we're gonna connect them and it looks nice. So, so that's the idea, right? So we want to determine function values f, uh, f of x uh, star, um, at a finite number of input locations. Uh, again, so there are a bunch of typos here. This should be a star. So x1, so x star 1 up to x star k. Then we want to compute the predictive distribution at some test points x star. So the predictive distribution at test points x star is f of x star given x star. By the definition of a Gaussian process, we know that the collection of all function values is jointly Gaussian distributed. That's the definition, right? So we're gonna exploit this now. And given that f of x star is now, <clears throat> is a finite number of values, then this predictive distribution will be Gaussian with mean, with a mean and a covariance matrix. And the mean is the evaluation of the prior mean function that we choose at the corresponding inputs x star. So that is, um, that's this term here. And the, the prior covariance evaluate, uh, so the covariance matrix is the, the, the prior covariance function evaluated um, at all pairs of X star. So that means every um, K I J is now the kernel evaluated at X star i and x star j. That is this, uh, how we compute this matrix. So this is a k by k matrix. So notations may be a little bit unfortunate because um, k is the uh, number of uh, test points, x star. <clears throat>
as I said, we exploited the de definition of a Gaussian process that all function values are jointly Gaussian distributed. So that's exactly where we get this one from. Um, and now to generate a function, we need to just sample from this joint Gaussian distribution. Yeah, every sample FK evaluated at the corresponding inputs, we can sample from this joint Gaussian distribution. You know, we can use libraries for doing this uh, in, in, in Python or R or any other programming language to sample from a multivariate normal distribution. So maybe in a bit more detail, if we want to generate, so this is from the, from the previous slide, if we want to uh, generate a function draw from this, um, from this distribution, we can define a vector m star, which is the, the prior mean evaluated at x star, at these test inputs x star. We can define this covariance matrix k star star, which is the prior uh, covariance function evaluated at these x star points. And then we can uh, really just draw a sample from a multivariate Gaussian distribution with mean vector m star and a covariance matrix k star star. And if we do this, then you know we have these. Uh, maybe the this is similar to the line that we had before, where we have these uh, maybe a hundred, where x star contains maybe a hundred points. Uh, and then if we connect these points and do some nice interpolation, then these the draws that we generate actually do look like function instead of just a collection of function values. So what we have done here is effectively making predictions with the Gaussian process prior. But now we want to do this with the Gaussian process posterior distribution. So we want to find the, first we want to find the posterior distribution P of F of X star. Right, so again, we have some test inputs X star, given the training set and the corresponding test inputs. We have the GP prior, which we can evaluate at the training points, uh, training inputs which is a Gaussian distribution where we evaluate the mean function at the, at the training inputs and have the, uh, the kernel matrix, uh, which is uh, small k evaluated at x and x. We have a Gaussian likelihood, uh, p of y given f and x, which is exactly this. So that's, uh, again, the evaluated at the uh, training inputs in this notation here. If we now look at the... Um, the training function values and the test function values, so f and f star, the Gaussian process tells us by definition that these function values are jointly Gaussian distributed. If you have a collection of, uh, of values, so f1, f2, and so on, if we have a Gaussian process and any finite subset would be jointly Gaussian distributed. So for example, we could say, P of F1 and F2 is Gaussian distributed with some mean and some covariance matrix. We now have a setting where we have F, which we define now as F1 to Fn, or, or maybe more clearly, F of X1 to F of Xn. So we have that, and we have f star, which we define as the vector f1 to fk, which is f of x1 to f of xk. So that is um, a vector in Rn, and this one is a vector in Rk. Then we have that P of F and F star is also Gaussian distributed. So because this entire thing is a collection of N plus K random variables. So it's definitely um, definitely small. Uh, so smaller than infinity is so a finite number of, of function values. It's jointly Gaussian distributed. And um, the distribution of this is given over here. So if I want to compute the uh, expected value of this joint distribution, 
then this expected value, and so maybe in more detail, so the expected value under f, uh, well, function now of the f vector is exactly m of x, which is this term here, and the expected value under, under the function of f star is m of x star, which is this term here. We also know that the, the variance of f at the training inputs is k, so that's this one here. We know that the variance of f at the test inputs is k of x star and x star. So that is this term. And these terms are the covariances between x, sorry, not x, but f of x and f of x star. And similar, that's the covariance between f of x star and f of x. And this is how we build this, uh, we build this covariance matrix by, by computing these blocks individually. What we now do is, what we want is, we want, a, um, we want to look at noisy observations, right? So instead of like having f over here, we in practice don't observe noise-free function values, but we observe noisy function values. So y equals f of x plus epsilon. Y is a linear transformation of, or affine transformation of a random variable, um, which the random variable is f of x, and we just perturb it by epsilon. So the mean will not change because the expected value of y is the expected value of f plus the expected value of epsilon. So expected value of f is m of x and epsilon expected value is zero. So that mean will not change. But if we compute the variance of y, that will be the variance of f, which is k, plus the variance of epsilon, which is sigma n squared. And that is exactly where this, this noise term enters the equation here. So that's the only change that we need to make in order to get the joint distribution between noisy observations and noise-free predictions. So does anyone have now an idea of how we get to what we want? P of F star given X, Y, and X star. So that's the last step that we need in order to, to get where we actually want to. How do we get from uh, here at the bottom to P of F star given X, X star, and Y? How do we get here? So the only thing we need to do is we need to compute a conditional distribution. So what is working in our favor here? So in our favor works that we are looking at Gaussian distributions and we know how to do conditioning in Gaussian. So we get this predictive distribution by applying those rules. And if we do this, we get uh, something that looks like this. So the Predictive distribution, the conditional distribution of F star given X, Y, and X star is Gaussian because we were, if we look at this joint distribution, if we, if we do a conditioning of a joint Gaussian distribution, that conditional distribution is Gaussian as well. So that's what we're going to use here. So the conditional distribution has a mean and a variance. That's the only thing that this, this term says. And the mean is the prior mean. So that's this part here, plus uh, k of x star and x times um, k plus sigma n squared i inverse times y minus m of x. That is the conditional mean of a joint Gaussian distribution where the entries of the mean and the covariance matrix are used from up here. And so if you, if you have done some sort of like signal processing before, 
then you could identify this term as a Kalman gain. Uh, so if you've done Kalman filtering, that is exactly what the Kalman gain is, and an error term between the observed uh, values y and the prior mean m of x. So that is exactly what is, what is this term here. And similar for the uh, posterior covariance, we get uh, a term that looks like this, which is the prior variance minus something that is non-negative. This kind of like non-negative term tells us how much information we can transfer from the training data, from the training f, uh, f of x to the test data f star of x. That is kind of like what this, this kind of like an information gain in some, of some sorts that we, that we can get. But both of these equations are uh, coming from the rules of con computing conditional distributions of joint Gaussian distributions. We were looking at a joint distribution of function values between training and test data. So we can compute that easily. And we said, okay, the training data is actually not noise free. So we have to have this, have to look at the noise term or the noisy observations. But because this is only a linear transformation of the, of the noise free version, we can also compute these, uh, this kind of like joint Gaussian distribution between the noisy training observations and the noise free predictive uh, values we are interested in. And then we get the predictive distribution by Gaussian conditioning, where now the mean uh, is this orange term and the variance or the covariance matrix is this uh, light blue term. So we have this like relatively complicated expression, but we can do a sanity check as well. And a sanity check is, uh, we're gonna look at the posterior Gaussian process again. So these are the equations that we computed earlier. Um, for the posterior mean and the posterior covariance function. And you can see that they kind of like look similar to what we just computed for, uh, for predictions. So if we now copy from the previous slide what we got, um, the predicted function values, uh, the distribution of the, the test function values look like this. And so that's a mean and that is the, the covariance matrix. If we now compare these terms, the only thing that we actually have done is replace the dot with x star. And what that means is in order to make a prediction with a Gaussian process, we evaluate the uh, posterior mean and the posterior covariance function at the finite number of inputs x star. And that would give us the mean and the variance of my predictive distribution. So that is kind of like, that's a good thing that these things are actually match up so the posterior GP is, is a formulation for an infinite dimensional object for, for distribution over functions. But when we actually want to make a prediction at a finite number of test inputs, we can just plug in the test inputs and, and replace these, these dots and evaluate those functions and they will give us the right answer. And we could derive that kind of property uh, through just conditioning of joint Gaussian distributions. So that is kind of like what, what, we, what we have done now. In the Bayesian inference setting, we need to specify a prior. So in this case, we have a prior over functions. We have an average function, so the mean function is zero, and the uh, shaded error kind of like encodes where we believe most function li values lie within. And we choose a squared exponential, also Gaussian kernel for this. So it also means we have uh, the assumption that um, you know, the underlying functions are smooth. These, you know, we've seen these plots before. These are draws from the Gaussian process prior. So what we're gonna have down here is now the marginal mean. So at, uh, at every input x star, I can choose now a point x star here. Then the, uh, this expression here is the expected value at this point of the of the function. So we average over all of those functions. And the variance will now tell us how much of a, an uncertainty we have marginally. So that is kind of like what 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 these two uh, equations will tell us. Not unexpected with a prior mean function of zero, our expected function value in the absence of any data will be zero. And we also know that the variance at a single point f of x is the 
covariance function evaluated at x uh, with itself. So that is what this green term looks like. So if we now start observing function values, then we see two things. So one is that the mean function changes and we can clearly see that the mean function here is no longer zero. And the posterior covariance is also not only the green term, which is the prior variance, but it's also minus this, this uh, non-negative term that we had a few slides ago. And this term tells us, again, like how much information we can transfer to other function values from the function values that we have observed, which are in our, uh, in our training data set. And so because of the smoothness assumptions in the, in the squared exponential or Gaussian kernel, the nearby function values are strongly correlated with the function value that we observe. And that means the uncertainty in this area is relatively small. But if we go far away, so if you think about maybe the length scale again, so if we go to maybe three, four times the length scale um, away from the observed uh, input, then you know we fall back to the prior and we can't really uh, transfer much knowledge to these function values. So we can continue doing this, observe more and more function values, and you can see how nicely the uh, the GP adapts. And um, if we were to sample now from this uh, posterior Gaussian process, then uh, these functions are much more constrained in regions where we have data compared to regions where we don't have data. So we, you know, they have full flexibility in the right hand, so on the right hand side here of this plot that basically says we're sampling from the prior in this area here. But you know we're much more restricted in these areas. So maybe to summarize what we have done at a at a at a high level is I try to bridge the gap between Bayesian linear regression and Gaussian processes. Try to kind of like map things from one uh, problem to to the uh, from the linear regression problem to the Gaussian process problem, and then we basically phrased the uh, learning of the. Uh, of the distribution over functions as an inference problem where we compute a posterior distribution. So at some length, we discussed uh, the priors, the properties of priors, uh, what are the ingredients, so mean functions and covariance functions, what are the critical parameters of the covariance functions, what do they control? Um, we briefly mentioned the marginal likelihood and then went to the posterior distribution, and it turned out that in order to uh, make a prediction using the posterior distribution, we simply have to compute the uh, just like a conditional uh, distribution of a joint Gaussian, or we evaluate the posterior mean and the posterior covariance function at the inputs of the, the test inputs that we are interested in. 